So this is our last program for Weber on Wednesdays, and it's going to be a fantastic program. In case you don't know who Irving Weber is, I'm going to give you the brief Irving Weber as opposed to the long Irving Weber. So the month of May is National Historic Preservation Month. So the library also does its celebration of local history in conjunction with National Historic Preservation. And we named it after Irving Weber because Irving Weber wrote more than 800 columns about Iowa City, Johnson County, history. And in fact, the city named him the official historian of Iowa City. We have all of the books upstairs. Um, you can also read them online as well as he wrote 800 columns for the Press Citizen. The Lions Club, of which he was a founding member, made eight books of his columns, which is about half of the columns. But the Press Citizen, excuse me, the Iowa City Public Library gave the other columns to scan the other columns, and now they are at the University of Iowa as well. You can find them through our catalog, and we use them all the time to do research, and I'm sure Anne will touch on them. And I know that you're here to hear about the horse, so I will. Yes, and he's waving. And so one of the things that someone suggested, and we didn't quite get to it this year, is during Weber days that we should hang up a poster on Irving Weber with all the events, and so next year, that's what we'll do. But with no further ado, let me let Anne talk. This is a, a um, great presentation of which you will now find. And feel, feel free to ask questions throughout or wait till the end. We are live on the library channel, and so I would like you to talk into the microphone so that people in the future can hear about this. Let me get out of your way. Thank you for coming. So yes, I am Anne Mangano and I am the Collection Services Coordinator at the Iowa City Public Library. And I have the privilege of working on the Information Desk. And one of the wonderful things about working on the Information Desk was, so I'm not from Iowa City, but I learned to love Iowa City through some of the historical questions that I get at the library. And I am back feeding, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and that's one thing that made me feel really connected to Iowa City, was just knowing its past. I, my father loved history, and he would drag me through all these different historical sites. We'd go to the library and research what was there before. We'd learn all about our neighborhood, past neighborhoods that he used to live in. Um, I knew my history of my family, and I knew the history of my town. And so when I moved here, I felt so lost, and the information desk um, kind of gave me that settling down. And, and so part of um, Larry Ginter, I got interested in him because I had to write a blog post. As an information, information desk librarian, every once in a while I have to write a blog post. And I like to write about local history. And so I decided to look up, what is Ardenia? And Ardenia is a offense um, at the corner of Summit and Kirkwood. And after looking at it just day after day after day, I was like, that fence does not belong to those condos. So what is it? Well, I went to Weber, and he explained it. Is there a problem? <laughs> um, Weber explained it. And, but he, he talks about how the land there used to be owned by the Lucas family. And he says, oh, we all know the Lucas family because of Robert Lucas, the um, territorial governor of Iowa. And we also know the family is owning the famous racehorse, Larry Ginter. And that's all he says. And so I was like, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know anything about Larry Ginter. And no one else did either. So um, I'm going to do an Irving Weber, and I'm going to research it and find out what happened. And so how famous is Larry Ginter? Well, if I can just give you some perspective, one of the first things I find is an obituary in the Manitoba Herald. It's, yes, the <laughs> Canada Manitoba. <laughs> And it's three columns long. Oh my goodness. And it talks about his history, who C.S. Lucas is, that's the, um, the owner. And they say he's one of the gamest, hard-hearted performers emanating from the Hawkeye State. So I have lots of questions. <laughs> One is, why is there a three-column obituary of a horse? <laughs> and the second question is, and why is a Manitoba newspaper writing about a horse from Iowa City? He was born in Iowa City. He died in Iowa City. And so he doesn't really have much of a history in Manitoba. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why harness racing, which Larry Ginter participated in, was, was just basically harness racing mania at the time. And Manitoba had, um, they had a couple horses that 
participated um, in some of the races that Larry Ginter was in, they saw the back of Larry Ginter quite a bit. <laughs> But let's, I digress a little bit, let's sit to Larry Ginter. He was born in 1893. He was foaled at Lucas Farms. He was owned by Colonel Edward Lucas for a little while, but most of the time it's Clark Lucas who is overseeing his races. Clark is at Colonel Edward Lucas's son. He was tall, he was five, about five feet from his shoulder down. He was a bay, so he was a reddish color and he had black hair and he has a little, he has one sock in the back. It's also important that he's a standard bred pacer. And so we all know thoroughbreds as the kind of the racing horse of the jockey and the rider, but standard breds are the ones who um, participate in harness racing. And what's weird about standard breds is that to be a standard bred, it's not necessarily that you're bred as one. You are, but you have to meet some certain standards to be one. You have to act, and they're racing standards, they're performance standards. It's not about appearance. So they have to, I think in 1898, they had to race two minutes and 30 seconds, a two minute, 30 second minute mile. All right, so. Some other things that are really important to know about Larry Ginter, and this is what I'm going to impress you with, is that he is sired by Medellin, a descendant of Hamiltonian. And if you knew anything about standard bread racing, you would say, oh my, oh wow. And if I can impress you further, his mother was Alice, also a descendant of Hamiltonian. He was also a pacer. There's two types of standard bread racers. There's trotters, and there's pacers. They're both trotting, they just have a different gait. Yes, <laughs> there's, um, and I'll talk a little bit about pacers um, in, in a, a little bit, but that's just important to note. So harness racing, this is Alex out of Muscatine, Iowa. He, she won at the Chicago World's Fair. And this is the first, so har I just wanted to use this as a, just a little slide to show you what harness racing is. People sit in the back of the horse on a sulky, and you race around about a half mile track, sometimes a little bit longer, and you do it in heats. So it's not just you run the race, you go in heats. So um, sometimes it's three times, and whoever wins the best out of three, sometimes it's five. Some terrible races make the horses do seven. Um, and there are different, also different categories. So trotters have their own races, Pacers have the, the others, and the reason why that is pacers are a lot faster than trotters. But they're also known as the poor man's trotter. So I'll get into the <laughs> history of that in a minute. Um, the, and there are different classes. So kind of like uh, wrestling, you have your weight class, you have your time class. So sometimes there's two, there's like the two, two minute 30 class, there's the two minute 20 class, two minute 15. Larry Ginter's racing at the 207 level. So when I get into Trotting, trotting is, if I can explain it right, forward and diagonal pairs. So your right front leg and left hind leg are moving at the same time, and then you switch. Pacers move their legs laterally, laterally so right front and right hind together. They look very weird when they're doing it, and there's only two other animals that race to run that way, camels and giraffes. So that's why they're called the poor man's trotter, because they look inelegant when they're running down the track. Yes, or actually it's Courier and Ives poster. And was it from the Columbia exhibition or from the Columbia, Columbia in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I bring this up because a little bit later, um, Lucas compares Larry Ginter to Alex and he's basically brought through the ringer in some of the newspaper. Uh -huh. um, Larry Ginter was actually bred to be a trotter but he showed um, he kind of an inclination to pace, and the American Trotter magazine said, for some reason, Lucas encouraged it. So to get an idea of how actually popular this was, um, 30,000 people went to Hartford, Connecticut in 1897 just to see one horse, John R. Gentry, beat the two-minute mile. And it was such a big event that the Edison Manufacturing Company came to um, film it. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And I'll just show the, just 
just the little bit that it does. Um, he didn't do it. <laughs> he didn't make two minutes. Just a little bit over. So all those 30,000 people were out of luck. But it's really wonderful. There's not a lot of videos of horse racing at this time. Um, this is a very, very early video, but they thought it was so important that it needed to be captured. And there's the one lonely horse. And it makes sense that it's incredibly popular. Horses are everywhere. I, I have to remember that a lot because now I can go weeks, I can go months without ever seeing a horse. But horses were a daily part of life. They helped us in our work, in agriculture. They were part of our transportation. And they were also heavily involved in our, in our wars. So naturally, they'd be part of our sports. In 1890, there were 314 professional racetracks in the United States. And every year, 364 days of the year, there were races, professional races. The day they didn't race, Christmas. And what also makes it really popular is there's gambling involved. Of course, there's money. And gambling was actually illegal in a lot of states. And so it's, it, I was really perplexed as to how it can be just flagrantly in the newspaper about People won all this money. Um, gamblers did this. And the reason why is booking was illegal. If you did a verbal bet, not illegal. That was the way they got around it. So they made that illegal at one point. And then eventually, they ended up just making horse racing illegal in some states. So in like the late 1910s, in, um, it starts, uh, you start seeing less race, horse racing. Two things make it incredibly popular in the 1870s, harness racing, just going over the top in mania, is the introduction of the Grand Circuit. The Grand Circuit ends up being kind of like the NFL or the NBA. It's the professional racing organization. And Larry Ginter gets to race at this level. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's mostly Midwestern and Northeastern cities. And they swapped out every once in a while, but some of the big ones were Memphis, always had a race every year as part of the circuit, Columbus, Cincinnati. And the thing that made the Grand Circuit really popular was the Pacer. The Pacer um, starts actually in the Midwest. They start breeding it there. And so people in the Northeast just thought, the, these terrible horses that look awful and they're putting them in these races and they're winning all of them. And so they end up making that category for the pacer and they take it out of the trotter. But they're far easier, easier to train. And they win everything. And they also, um, they get down to that two minute mile. So that's why John R. Gentry, he's a pacer and he's getting close to the two minute mile. Before that, horses were racing at 2.20 and 2.30. So they bring down the time a lot. It also made horse racing a little bit more accessible for that professional class. So it makes sense that C.S. Lucas is able to participate in this racing because he has a horse that he can easily train. He doesn't have to pay tons and tons of money to train a horse. And so John R. Gentry may not have made it, but that same year, Star Pointer, a horse from Chicago, does do the two-minute mile. He wins at 159 and a quarter. And it just wants, begs to be topped by Dan Patch. So if you know anything about harness racing, you know about Dan Patch. Dan Patch, um, he drew 93,000 people to the Minnesota State Fair to see him race at 155 and a quarter. And after he does that, he, he retires and he goes on a world tour. He tours in Europe, he tours in the United States, he gets um, cigars named after him, he gets his own tobacco. He has two songs, the Dan Patch March and the Dan Patch Two Step. He has bridges, railway lines, uh, washing machine, the wa like the fastest washing machine on the market was the Dan Patch washing machine. And, um, he gets his own private railway car, and one of the things that I remember Dan Patch from is a story called So Dear to My Heart. I had the novelization of that, and in the beginning, the 
the hero of that story goes and sees Dan Patch go stretch his legs at the local Indiana, he lives in Indiana, but he goes to see it at the local train station. The horse stretches his legs, the horse goes back in, and he wants a horse so bad, he goes home, his, his grandmother gives him a sheep. Oh. And he names him Danny Patch. So he marks the peak of harness racing in popularity, particularly to a national frenzy. And this manifested itself in Iowa too. So Iowa had a, actually a deep reputation. In the 1880s, this man named Charles Williams, he goes to Independence, Iowa, and he starts his own racetrack called Rush Park. And he has a great stable. And two of his horses, Extel, which is over here, and Allerton, they're trotters. So their numbers are really low for trotters. And it just, it just his um, racetrack greatly increases just the reputation of Iowa, in, and they establish some circuits, and people start sending their horses from all over the country to Iowa to race. If you're interested in racing in Iowa at this time, there's many different circuits you can participate in. Uh, and if you use these circuits, you can yeah, you can push yourself into some of the bigger circuits, like that grand circuit. You have to kind of make time here to get, kind of like a marathon, you have to qualify. And what was nice about circuits is that you could go from park to park every weekend. So if you're doing the Southwestern Iowa short shipment circuit, you can go to one place um, one weekend, and then you can go very, like maybe two towns over to the next racetrack. There were racetracks in almost every city in Iowa. Um, it, from Sac City to Tipton to West Liberty. Um, there's different places. The big ones, though, were in Des Moines, Dubuque, which had Nutwood Park, Independence, like I said, and Waterloo, which was Home Park. And railroads would also uh, have packages so that you could just buy a package for the railroad and then you could ship your horse from town to town. I was going to make a slide of all the cities, but um, it got too big <laughs> from Iowa. And so other places I had them that where I felt was surprising was Orange City, Atlantic, Victor. Victor, Larry Ginter holds the track record at Vin Victor, although Victor no longer exists. Wilton, Shenandoah, Wapolo, West Point, Audubon. Columbus Junction was also a big one. This is just the 1892 racing dates, professional races in Iowa alone. And so you can spend pretty much the month of August, September, and October at some track in Iowa. Not all of them because they have competing race dates. Iowa City actually started racing a tradition a lot earlier than that. In 1860, they built a racetrack at the fairgrounds where Finn and Feather are, is because they held the Iowa State Fair that year. So we've had a racetrack since 1860. We no longer do, but we did. And this is the bird's eye view of 1867, and there people are harness racing, or maybe practicing. And then when they moved the fairgrounds over in about, um, I want to say it was 1890, they moved it to the city high, where city high is. And you can kind of see evidence of where the track used to be, Morningside Drive and Wilton Street. Wilson, Wilson Street. Um, And I wanted to talk a little bit about the State Historical Society of Iowa's picture file. <laughs> they have a great file on the fairgrounds, as well as harness racing in Iowa in general. So some of these photos come from there. This is from the Patterson Memorial Photo Collection. The Patterson family were a prominent family in Iowa City in um, about 1900. And in 1907, Lemuel Patterson dies and they give $4,000 in his memory to the Iowa City Public Library. It helped really establish our collection. And they also gave us some scrapbooks. And they're now at the, they're preserved at the State Historical Society. And they show life in Iowa City in 1900. And so here's a picture of the fairgrounds. They also captured the uh, grandstand of the racetrack. There's the observation deck, that cone tower, that's so you can look down and see the noses of the horses as they pass the finish line. And this roundhouse was actually originally on the, fair, the original fairgrounds, and it, they had to move it to the new fairgrounds where City High was um, as part of the deal to get the land. Some other great photos <laughs> that the State Historical Library has. 
um, State Historical Society has is this beautiful picture of harness racing happening around 1914 on our racetrack. None of them are Larry Ginter, I'm sorry. And here's another photo from 1908, um, kind of the, another view of the racetrack, kind of see some of the horse barns in the back. In 1901, the Iowa City Racing Association is established at the fairgrounds. They wanted to kind of buy into what that Charles Williams was having, those circuits. They wanted to bring that to Iowa City. They did not do that. They actually did not do that. It was a failure, even though this says bright hopes for future. What I love about the Iowa City papers is whenever anything happens, I did this with steamboat research, when like a steamboat would come to town and they say, now we're a port. And then like five years later, another steamboat comes. I, and so they, had, they wanted to establish these races on July 4th and then one in September. And really the only participants are people from Iowa City. But we did have a lot of people who had horses that were harness racers. And here's some of them. Um, Dr. Potter is a veterinarian, and he had a horse named Josie Egan, and she raced a lot with Larry Ginter. They bought um, the railroad cars a lot together, and Potter drove Larry Ginter quite a bit in races. Young Pat was owned by John Buck. Um, Young Pat also had a really good record, and he held a lot of um, track records at Iowa racetracks. And then another person that's not on here, because he didn't own horses, but he did um, train them, is Thomas Appleby. And I'm going to mention him a little bit later, but I did want to say that he was really, um, you'll see his name a lot when I get to Larry, some of Larry Ginter's record, but he was part of this group. I thought I would just read the paper, the Iowa, City and Iowa Citizen has some great articles about what's going on in the racetrack. And every once in a while, they'll just check in and say, and I thought this was quite a wonderful way of showing some color. So it says, George Supel has two horses out there. And during the pleasant day we had a week or so ago, they were worksome. Thomas Appleby has a stable that is promising. And William Weidenkopf has a stallion and several colts that have metal in them. Charlie Bell is breaking in some colts, too, that are inclined to climb telephone poles. <laughs> but Charlie can handle them all right. But there are others to follow soon. Jake Lucas will be taking Larry Ginter out there one of these days, and Doc Potter has Josie Agin, the little pacer with which he won the gentleman's road race last fall, and will soon be doing some work with several other green horses that will be turned over to him. Then there is George W. Swords Leona that will be doubling the course at a swift clip. W.A. Murphy, too, will be on the tops. Oh, there will be plenty of horse talk during the spring. And when the working out commences in earnest, there will be plenty of race course fence flies or blackbirds to line the track and the click of the stopwatch will be heard. So Iowa City had a pretty well established, tight knit racing community. But I really think that the, their wanting to do that Iowa City Racing Association and bring horse racing to Iowa City was all because of one Larry Ginter. <laughs> and they were kind of piggybacking on his success. So let's get into Larry Ginter. I kind of went on a little bit of a bird walk with harness racing and what was going on in Iowa City. So. Let's just get right to Larry, because he is our star attraction. He, um, as I said earlier, he was foaled by Colonel Edward Lucas. And Colonel Edward Lucas, as being the son of Robert Lucas, the territorial governor, was also a man, like, he was kind of larger than life himself, too. And he, he had a small farm. He had about 50 shorthorn cattle at the time, um, 15 horses, but about 300 trees in his orchard. But he was also uh, president and founding member of the Johnson County Agricultural Society. He was really into standards, um, making sure that the shorthorn cattle, that Iowa had good breeding and was um, up to snuff in the United States. He also served as a state representative. Um, and he was postmaster of Iowa City. He was appointed by Johnson in 1867 as a Democrat, removed from office by Grant when he came into, because um, those were political appointments. And then I think the thing that makes him even more fascinating is that he was in the Civil War. He was lieutenant colonel in the 14th Regiment. He was captured at the Battle of Shiloh. He ended up being at Libby Prison in Arlington, Virginia for less than a year. And then he comes back after, when he's paroled and he resigns from the army because he wants to start a cavalry union. And the reason why is because he loves horses. 
Um, and legend has it is that he rode a horse from Ohio to Iowa. Some people say by himself when he was 13 to join his father here, but others say that he was with his mother. So I don't know, <laughs> but the story is much better if he does it by himself. But he also of note marries Phoebe Clark in uh, 1852. She was a prominent, um, she was from a very prominent family in Iowa City. And Ezekiel Clark, her brother, was um, C.S. Lucas, or uh, Edward Lucas's partner. But for most of Larry Ginter's life, he was owned by Clark S. Lucas, and this is his resume as of 1900. He lives with his mother, and he works on the farm, his family farm. That's not owned by him, it's owned by his mother. <laughs> but he continues on, and I bring that up not to make fun of him, but to talk about how Larry Ginter is pretty much his claim to fame. And which is what really differentiates him from his father. The first time um, Larry races is he's five years old, and that is a very old age for a horse to start. Usually you see two-year-olds, three-year-olds. Um, Extel, that horse from Independence, Iowa, burned out at four years old. So it's weird for Larry Ginter to just start at five and to be so successful. His first race was in... Dav or, yeah, Davenport on July 29th, 1898, and he did okay. Um, much better when he was racing at the Iowa City racetrack, he was first. But uh, at least he showed promise, and his fastest time was 215 and a quarter miles um, in Columbus Junction. That year he ran 10 races, and he won six of them, so not, not too bad. But he's in a higher class category. Later that year, he has an accident. So on October 4th, 1898, Larry Ginter, he's riding in a train car from C Iowa City to Cedar Rapids. They take the car, they slam it against uh, um, the engine. Larry somersaults, his trainer, Thomas Appleby, is in there, and uh, he gets injured. And Thomas Appleby does too. He, uh, Thomas Appleby gets kicked <laughs> by the horse as the horse is doing the somersault. And Lucas is, is just incensed <laughs> that his racehorse is, has such a good six and ten. He's going to lose a lot of money now. And so he sues the railway. Sing. Is that again, the accident? What year? 1898, October 4th. And he claims that the railroad employees were careless and rough. And he sues them for $4,000 for damages to the horse, because the horse is a valuable horse. And he um, also wants 1000 for Thomas Appleby's injuries. <laughs> right, you know. And it isn't so much a physical injury. He thinks that the, the horse is psychologically damaged. Um, he is jumpy. He will not sit in his harness. The jury goes out and sees in March of 1899. They go out to the stable to see Larry Ginter and how upset this horse is. And he wins. Um, and here's the, uh, I think, what they say about um, Thomas Appleby. His injuries were pretty bad. He got kicked in the groin, and then he, um, an upper portion of his right leg, he had a hard time walking. Um, but he wins the lawsuit. He's awarded $2,500. I don't know what Tom Thomas Appleby's suit went, because no one was paying attention to that. because. <laughs> Um, the railway is just, we're not paying this. He, we're going to pay him $100. That's the normal amount that we give to a damaged horse. Because you never said it was a racing horse. That's their argument. You said it was just a regular horse. And we, if we had known he was a racing stallion and he was worth that much, we would have treated him much differently. But since he was just a normal horse, we can throw him around all we want. Um, so... The, they win on the appeal, I mean, sort of, in that they reduced the winnings to $1,800, and they appeal again and said, no, 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 we're not paying this. And it goes to the Iowa Supreme Court, and the Iowa Supreme Court says, yeah, you have to pay him. And it goes back to the original verdict. That's actually not the only Supreme Court case dealing with Larry Ginter, case <laughs> <laughs> Lucas, and this incident. In turn... Uh, Lucas is sued by a man named John W. Hess, and he is a horse trainer. And he contracted with C.S. Lucas to train Larry Ginter during this year, and the contract had ended in November 1st, 1898. And per the contract, 
he got half of his winnings. And I think what Hess is saying, that means either on the track or off the track. And so Lucas says to him, OK, if you can pay half of the lawyer's fees while I'm going through this lawsuit, you can get half of the winnings. And Hess says to him, I can't pay that. I don't have any money to pay half of the court fees. So Lucas says, then you're not getting half of the winnings. And Hess says, I'm suing you. He's perfectly able to pay for a lawsuit against Lucas. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, Judge Wade, who was a founding uh, member of the, or he founded the Iowa City Public Library, or he helped find it, um, saw, heard the case in the Johnson County Courthouse. He found for Hess, saying that Hess needs to um, be compensated after the measurements of the payment of the lawyer's fees. And uh, Lucas says, no, I'm not doing that. And he appeals, and it goes to the Iowa Supreme Court, and they say, yes, you do have to pay him. So. <laughs> Um, bittersweet. So after all of that, does Larry race again? Is he really psychologically damaged? Well, he takes two years to get back onto a racetrack. And he's a far better horse. Um, he brings his, down, his time down to 2, 11 and a quarter at Freeport, Illinois, when he was um, on the racetrack of August 8th, 1901, his first appearance. And the horse review wrote, in view of the fine campaign made by Larry Ginter this past season, who besides reducing his record to 2.11 and a quarter, showed publicly on various occasions that he might have beaten 2.10, it would seem that the horse was hardly injured to the extent alleged in the trials before the district and Supreme Courts of Iowa. And they're right, because he has a comeback, and what a comeback. Uh, in 1902, he brings down his uh, record. He get, joins the 210 club. He goes to 208 and 3 fourths at Taylor Park in Freeport, Illinois. I showed the satellite image because I loved going and looking at the communities and trying to figure out where the racetrack was. Some of them are still automobile um, tracks, but some of them have been, been um, either made into residential areas where you can kind of see where the curve of the road is, or they were made into parks and they have nice walking paths like in Freeport. And in 1902, he qualifies for the Grand Circuit, so he um, shows up in Memphis. And this is, that means he starts showing up in the Boston Globe or the Philadelphia Inquirer or the New York Times. And you can see that he's in the 208 pacing class because he got his time down to 208. But, and Appleby is up on him, and, uh, but he doesn't do so well. He's a little bit down in the count. But he's still on the Grand Circuit. He's at a professional level. And he brings down his time again the next year, 207 and a, and a quarter at Davenport, which means that he gets to be at the Grand, he gets qualifies for the Grand Circuit in Cincinnati, Ohio. Oakley Park was a huge park, and you wanted to get your horse into Cincinnati. And he won second place in this category. And I think this race is the one where he makes, yeah, he makes um, $45,000, Lucas does. And he gets better. Um, in 1904, he gets first place in his category in Columbus. And he gets down to 206 and 3 fourths. And I love this, um, that every heat was a race, and 10 of the 11 starters fought like fiends to beat out the Iowa City streak of lightning in the shape of a horse. But the Lucas Pacer was too swift for them all. Larry took the sixth place in the first heat and looked hopelessly out of it except to those who knew him best. And then he turned in, shot across the line twice yeah. in succession ahead of the bunch, and captured a big slice of the $1,500 purse. Pauline G, that horse that got in second, is also always in the um, counts. And she got her vengeance the next week um, at, uh, in, another, in Cincinnati. Again, he gets third place right after Pauline G. And down here is Redbird at the very, very bottom. It's a, man, it's a Winnipeg horse, Manitoba. So um, there's some, the red, red Wing is also in here, and that's also a horse from Manitoba. And so I always think maybe they just always involve the Larry Ginter races, and Larry Ginter just does so much better. So he needs an obituary. Um, but then he has an off year. Uh, but I did want to talk about this one race at Waterloo, and it shows a little bit of the gambling. 
Um, on August 4th, 1905, he's pitted against a, or pitted is a weird word because it's not like he knew that, but, um, or anybody, I think Lucas knew that, but Baby Kid is a Cedar Rapids horse. He's, Baby Kid's doing a really good, um, really good run this year. And the Cedar Rapids, a couple people from Cedar Rapids say, we're going to bet $2,000, which is about $50,000 at the time, that Baby Kid is going to win the race. And a couple people from Waterloo said, no, nah, I think Larry Ginter's going to win this one. And they had a really, really good time. This is the Waterloo Times Tribute. Sticking it to Cedar Rapids <laughs> that Larry Ginter did win the race. And um, as for Cedar Rapids and Fort Dodge Sports, they will have to be content to paint fire scenes on the backs of their linen disasters and seersuckers because they can't afford to buy winter clothing because they owe us $50,000. And it's just like this flaunting of gambling. It wasn't about the race at all. It was all about Cedar Rapids was wrong and we were right. Eat it, Cedar Rapids. <laughs> Um, the next year, in 1906, he gets his best race in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He goes down to 206 and a, and a half, his personal best time, and there's Red King um, from Manitoba, or from Winnipeg, yeah, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, um, he, was four, he was 13 years old when he raced this race. So in the next year, he retires. He runs three races that year, and then Lucas calls it quits. And so after, so 14 years old, he had raced 61 races, won first money in 26 of them, second money in 15, third money in five, fourth money in six, but failed to win the money of nine. So he had a really good record. And Lucas is quoted on his retirement. He's through for now all time for all time. He's been awfully good to me, and it's a whole lot of satisfaction to know that while I have raced him hard, met all sorts of company, some with more speed than I had, he has come home each year with a few dollars earned, and as he stands today, he doesn't owe me a cent, and will end his days right here where he is in his birthplace. It reminds me of Black Beauty, because Black Be in Black Beauty there's a quote that I always remember is, good people make good places. And I mention that because unlike many, many owners, Lucas did not sell Larry Ginter when his racing career was over. Many people did. Young Pat, another horse from Iowa City, had a good racing record, not as good as Larry's. He got sold immediately. Um, and Extel, that horse um, from Independence that only raced for four year, for, until he was four years old, he was sold for $105,000 by Williams um, as soon as he was done. So it's not that Lucas didn't get many offers, he did because he would have made a good, Larry, they, there was speculation that he would have made a good stud horse. And Lucas did send him out to stud. None of the horses that Larry Ginter sired were any good. No. Although they had great names. Um, Larry Duck is my favorite name. He's a horse from Tipton. Betty Ginter, Pat Ginter, huh. Young Ginter. Um, <laughs> But he got to spend his final days on, in uh, the Lucas Orchard. Did they just spell his name differently? Oh, yeah, that was, um, so Larry Ginter was spelled differently often. So the first time around, I didn't find that much with just L-A-R-R-Y, -A -A as I understood his name to be. But if you go, L and then when I did L-A-R-R-I-E, there was a lot more. So it's interchangeable, even in the same publication even in the same article. <laughs> he died in the summer of 1910. What happens to Lucas? So I think Larry Ginter's death is a big thing for C.S. Lucas. His, his kind of life starts to change a little bit, but something else happens to him the next year. His mother dies. And so the Lucas Farms property is up for, uh, it's up for probate. And he gets married. In 1913, he's 54. He marries Hannah Strohmeyer. She's 40. And she's a dressmaker. She's German and she's Catholic. And it's things that Lucas are not. <laughs> and he retires from farming and he, they buy a house or they build a house on Walnut Street, 921 Walnut Street, still there. And he dies on August 
1934. And I wanted, I thought what was really interesting about his obituary was most of the column is all about his grandfather and his father. And then when you get to the fourth, it says, Mr. Lucas was a keen horseman and developed a number of well-known racehorses, the most noted of which was the famous Larry Ginter, with the fastest record of any horse ever reared in this county. So Clark, Clark Lucas did have something that was his own. He was a better horseman than his father. His father may have ridden a horse from Ohio to Iowa, but C.S. Lucas, Clark Lucas, or Jake Lucas, as his name was, all, he had three names, um, got a horse in the Grand Circuit, raised professionally, made a ton of money, <laughs> his own money. And I think that's perhaps why Larry Ginter got to retire into the orchard trees. What happens to harness racing? So within a few years of Larry Ginter's passing, we have automobiles. I, I kind of think that what made harness racing uh, doable um, was the railroad. And I feel like with technology, giveth, technology giveth, taketh away. So harness racing was made a national sport because you could go from place to place fairly quickly. But as soon as transportation turns into an individual, pro individual thing, and you don't need the horse to be like in, when, from going within a town, um, and you can just get an automobile. People want to race that. It's faster, it's more dangerous, and perhaps more fun. And then you don't need to feed it, and it doesn't need to have special care, uh, I mean, outside of just general mechanics. And of course, we know the rest of the story. The horse is no longer the important and necessary animal it was. And uh, there's a book called Farewell to the Horse and Ulrich Rolf um, that just came out. And that's his whole thing, is the 20th century is when we say farewell to the horse. There is still harness racing, though. Uh, it is an elite and a niche sport. And it's reserved for mostly the wealthy. And I think the purses now are $2 million. <laughs> Perhaps the most telling sign of decline in popularity among the masses of harness racing is that when they built the new Johnson County Fairgrounds in its current location, they didn't build a racetrack. And regardless, we can remember those days through the shape of the curve of Morningside Drive, Wilson Street, and of course, Ginter Avenue, which is named for Larry Ginter, when Lucas, um, when Lucas Farms was broken up into residential housing, Larry Ginter got a street. And I think it's just a reminder of Iowa City's Jake Lucas and Larry Ginter's place in, uh, in harness racing history. And that is my tale. I'd like... I'd like to thank Charles Scott from the State Historical Society of Iowa in Iowa City. He really helped me comb through some of the images. And a big thank you to Paul Wilder from the Harness Racing Museum and Hall of Fame in Goshen, New York. I'm definitely going there next time I am out east. And he really um, kind of got me some of the articles. They have full runs of all of the um, uh, periodicals on harness racing at the time. So I was able to kind of really hone down in my research. Do we have questions? I can try to do my best to answer. So I wanted to point out that you had that list of um, horse, horse owners and addresses. And one of the horse owners was two initials and then the name Wales. And Wales Street was part of the Wales addition to Iowa City. And it's right next to the race, where the racetrack would have been. And it says that he has a country address R.W. Wells, and his country address was in the country, but it's now Wells very Street. much a part yeah. of Iowa City. So if you look at the map... He's a poultry fancier. If, if you look at the map of, that you had earlier, you can see that Wales Street is right next to there. So it's, there's Wales, and then Garden. And so that um, would have been right... His, it was, he had a great large amount of land, and so he was right next to the fairgrounds. <clears throat> Candace, do you? What would they have done with Larry after he died? Oh, like, oh yeah, so rumor has it, and I don't know if this is true, because it's just one little article by Joanna Nelson De Beers when she, she says, legend has it that Larry Ginter is buried on Ginter Avenue. 
had, had you heard that, Judy? No, I've never heard. So Judy lives in the Lucas, on Ginter. Lucas Farms area and has done wonderful research. In fact, she did a program last week, which we'll soon have ready to, to share. And so now you and Anne can figure out where Larry's buried. Yes. <laughs> Any I'll, other? Um, I also should mention Larry Ginter's name. It's a very weird name because usually you pick, when you name a horse, you'd pick the part of the name of the sire and part of the name of the mother, and that's not the case at all. Well, the other pro thing in my research that was really hard to comb through was there was a Larry Ginter who was a horse racer yeah. in Sedalia, Missouri, and he had horses that were racing at the exact same time, and Luke, uh, Jake Lucas used to bring his horse down to Sedalia to train, and I wonder if he just named, I don't know if it's an homage or just a tease that, <laughs> that um, he has a horse named Larry Ginter. Um, that did much better than any of Larry Ginter's horses. Hang on, Judy. So, um, I did notice a few times you mentioned Jake Lucas. Was this C.S. Lucas's so, nickname? Yep. Okay, this links something. Um, Mary Lou Buchanan, who is a longtime Iowa City resident, uh, she is now in the Solon nursing home. I've befriended her with some of my research, and she talks about Uncle Luke and Aunt, or Uncle Jake and Aunt Jane, but I've had the hardest time kind of piecing together who was Uncle Jake. It just didn't make sense to me. And so this is the first time I've heard C.S. Lucas referred to. Is, How did you put that together when you saw that, that Jake and C.S. were one and the same? Well, I, it, was, it was his first, so I didn't put it up here, but his first obituary where, um, where they announced that he died, and they said, Jake Lucas dies, and then they say, C.S. Lucas passed away today. Okay. And I was like, oh, he's also Jake. So that really helped in other research of trying to find more information about, because the newspaper often just referred to him as Jake Lucas, but I was trying to find Clark Lucas and C.S. Lucas, and I had never heard of Jake until I actually figured out when he died and got his death date. Okay. And I had a hard time figuring out his death date because cause I couldn't find the obituary because it was under Jake. Um, but his death certificate, they spelled his name wrong, and so I couldn't find an ancestry <laughs> until I said, maybe I'll just put an E on the end of Clark, and then huh. I was able to find it. But you have done an amazing job. I've lived on Ginter Avenue for 42 years, and I do neighborhood history, uh, and I reach a lot of dead ends sometimes, you know, and I'm trying to sort some of this out. W one thing I would clarify, I just thought you did an incredible job, but um, C.S. Lucas's mother, you said she passed away? In 1911. Okay, I'm, I'm going to double check that. That confused me a little bit, but we do know that in 1909 is when the family broke up the farm, uh, there, and they was, built the house at the end of what is now Ginter Avenue, mm -hmm. and that house was built just for people to come, like, to meet with realtors. And they have some documentation there, but they haven't gotten it out for me yet. They did. I did come across a time where they were trying to sell land to somebody, and there were some lawsuits there that Phoebe Lucas is named in the lawsuit, um, particularly in the 1909 time. Okay. And Mary Pritchard, Martha yeah, Pritchard, also right. was tied at some, because the Lucases, the Kirkwoods, and the Clarks all married one another and so mm -hmm. sometimes it's very confusing and they kept naming everyone Robert and right. William and Edward and <laughs> so but it just is incredible how much information you found because I've tried to find at least some and I found a few things and I'd mentioned to her I found a uh, tobacco Larry Ginter tobacco so I'm more convinced that that probably is related to you know because of the level of notoriety right. great job thank you Um, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, really cool. Um, my question is, if people were coming to Iowa City from out of town with their horses on train, would they have, dis do you think, would they have disembarked from the train like in the Crandic line and then rode their horse up to there or would they have gone on that railroad line and gone off there? So, so railroads were obviously very important to Iowa City in the the Burlington Cedar Rapids Northern. I think that's the four words of that. It came in one way into town, and 
I'm not sure if it went to the, do you know off the top of your head if it went to that depot or did it go? What about that spur to Elmira? That the, these are very good questions. <laughs> and, how, and how can people find out the answers to these? Yes. <laughs> they can come to the library, but one of them sweeps, you know, east and west and then goes out north, whereas the other one comes down and crosses over the river south of town. Yeah, and, but you don't think that they would have been on that kind of a route? Like, that was just people? Okay. Yeah, and remember, not a lot of people actually went to Iowa City out, from out of town to race their horses. Um, they, tried, they tried with that Iowa City Racing Association, but when you look at the horses that were being raced, it was pretty local. If, if anything, maybe West Liberty, people came Tipton. from West Liberty. Tipton. I mean, the the because uh, Iowa City has an interest. The whole agricultural fair that started with the um, because Iowa was the territorial capital and then the capital, so it had a, a state fair. But its its current county fair is far different than many county fairs. Like the county fair where I grew up was a very much um, it had the 4-H aspect to it, but it had a whole lot more, including stock car racing, which was the yeah. horse Great racing pressure. track where we grew up. And uh, and Iowa City was just kind of a, a different one. It had a lot of things that draw people into town, but not not that. Right. Now I want to find out about Larry Duck. Yes. <laughs> so what was Ardenia? Was uh, that? So, yes. Did you say? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, Judy, you want to answer that? Okay, you I'll briefly give you an answer. So Ardenia it, was renamed in about 1925 by Albert Berkeley, who owned the Berkeley Hotel down in downtown Iowa City. He was described as an eccentric and loved to embellish things. And he bought a farm that belonged to the a farmhouse that belonged to the Lucas family. And then he remodeled it in 1925 to resemble a, a castle from England, although the only Ardini I've found is in Scotland, so I'm not sure if that was a mistake too in the printing. And so it had this wonderful facade uh, looking like a castle. And of course the Great Depression hit and no one needed a house that looked like a castle. And he ended up losing a lot of money himself. So then it got kind of parceled out into apartments and a boarding house. And you know, it never really recovered from that. Um, it, it really went into disrepair. And then in the 80s, early 90s, it was the Emanuel House of Prayer, which was kind of a precursor to like a homeless shelter. And some neighbors close by complained a lot. A developer came in with this concept to tear it down and build condos. And there was a group involved in Friends of Historic Preservation. We tried to save it. And I was allowed to go inside. I did videotape inside. And sometime maybe we'll do a story on Ardenia. Um, but it was torn down in the early 90s. And it, it was built originally, the house, in 1855. Um, was there a fire there? I sort of remember a story about a fire truck not being able to get in because of the fence. Oh, I do not remember a story about that. If that happened, it would have been quite a while ago, or maybe that was a sub story that that maybe it was a justification. A justification, yeah. but if there was a fire, it had to be a fairly small event. Or we could do some research. Yes. And Anne has a. a an announcement to make about the Iowa City Press Citizen. So a lot of your oh, yeah. research, can you talk about yeah, the what thing sources that, you used? Well, so um, I used mostly newspaper archive, uh, obviously Google Books, because they have had digitized a lot of the horse racing books at the time, uh, and Ancestry, and the Cedar Rapids Gazette, which is digitized through the Cedar Rapids Public Library. And what really is frustrating to do this presentation right now is that I know in a month or two we will have the Iowa City Press Citizen digital or the Iowa City Citizen and um, previous papers going back to like the 1840s digitized 
um, up to 1924. So I would have been able to type in Larry as Larry A L A R R Y and L A R R I E and found a lot more. And so I'm pretty sure that there are far more stories and more layers um, that I have yet to uncover, which is exciting. But also, I could have told you all about them, but maybe we'll do it. Larry Ginter. 2019. Ginter. Yeah. <laughs> Larry Ginter. Died. Yeah. Everything that you learned today is wrong. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Amy. Yeah. This was a great presentation.